Story 1. Each of you knows that the road is quite a dangerous and often mystical place. In my 30 years as a truck driver, I've seen all sorts of things. But the devil that happened to me just the other day, not only that defies any logical explanation, it made me look at our world a little differently. At that time, I was on my way to Novosibirsk from Omsk. A standard route as I understand it, which is not the first time I'm going to take. And in principle, nothing foretold trouble. But as you know, on every route, there are places to which some mystique is attributed because of the frequent accidents and the like. I didn't believe it all, since we're living in the 21st century after all. And as I said, I've seen all sorts of things. And with the help of science can explain any phenomenon or phenomenon on our planet. But that's what I thought. But as it turned out, not really. I left in the evening. The customer begged me tearfully to hurry up because they had a burning plan and urgently needed materials. I'm a kind man by nature, so I decided to go straight through Highway M51. This was a road I rarely drove on, and only during daylight hours. But based on my experience, I figured it wouldn't be too hard to drive almost 700 kilometers along the empty road at night. Plus, it's already unloaded. The train cut through the darkness with the lights, overcoming kilometers for kilometers. Passing by villages, I invite the people who could afford a good night's sleep at that late hour. After all, sleep was slowly beginning to deflect me. It was already past 10 o'clock p.m. on the clock. And being still in my right mind, I decided to look for a gas station in order to drink some coffee and take a couple of energy drinks. Just in case, I marked it on the map on my navigator and it showed me the distance to the next gas station. I turned up the volume on the tape recorder and the cabin was filled with long-ago arrivals. But with such beloved motives, half an hour later, turning right, I pulled into the gas station. I parked so as not to interfere with a few visitors to the gas station and headed inside. When I got to the door, I opened it. A boy in his early twenties appeared in front of me. He looked up at me and took a step back. I in turn did the same and waved at him, indicating that he was supposed to be first by the rules of etiquette. The modern generation has long since forgotten them. A fleeting thought flashed through my head. The boy smiled and nodded. Then he rushed out of the market. I in my turn went inside and involuntarily looked at the car he was driving when he reached the cash register. It was an old white Honda from the 90s. Even through the window you could see that the car was well maintained and the owner had obviously invested a lot of money in it. I say this as a person who is already of age, that is, has experience of life already far above 55. And as I got to that age, I started paying attention to little things. Why I did it, he knows. I didn't want to go into it. As here we are sitting here with you for long hours. So I grabbed a coffee and headed for the car. After leaving the gas station, I picked up a comfortable for me and my car 80 kilometers per hour and drinking coffee continued moving towards my destination. In an hour, the route began to go into the woods in that place. It was like a nature reserve. Road, though not bad, but the speed still slackened as you know. God forbid, a boar or wolf run out on the road, and a large load of safety is not so easy to stop, and it is a pity to spoil the bumper. The life of any animal is much more precious. I finally finished my coffee and put the empty cup. I looked back at the road. The car tilted forward. The wheels squealed. I don't know how. By some miracle, I managed to stop in front of the white Honda. How I didn't see where it came from. Wait, that's that guy's car from the gas station. Usually at night on the highway, I don't get out of the car. I don't even stop, because from personal experience, there are too many crooks. But here is a completely different case. The car, apparently, hit a bump and then flew off into the opposite one. In the headlights, I could see the man behind the wheel, but rather only his face. I didn't hesitate for a second and got out of the car, taking the flashlight with me. The light from the headlights was enough in principle, but there was little else. I ran up to the wrecked Honda. I tried to open the driver's door, but unfortunately, it jammed. Apparently, the body was badly deformed, as the other doors were also locked. I knocked on the driver's window, which surprisingly survived. There was no response from the kid. 
though by dedicating a flashlight, I could definitely see he was inside. So I, having come up with nothing better to do, squeezed the flashlight and knocked out his window, then dedicated it on the driver. But immediately I bounced back, as there was a handle sticking out of his chest. It looked like it was either a kitchen knife or some other domestic, edged weapon. I looked around at once, frantically moving the flashlight around me. In an instant, two eyes gleamed out of the dark, dense thicket. I froze and returned the beam to the spot where it seemed someone had just been, and began to back toward the car, little by little. There where I could see the silhouette clearly, and two huge eyes, there was no one there anymore. Climbing into the car, I grabbed my phone and dialed for an ambulance. I shuddered. I dropped the phone from my hand and spooked myself out of the car. As I drove around the Honda, I sped away from the Godham Sanctuary. Story 2 Well, I think it's time to tell what happened to me and my friends exactly 10 years ago. For a long time I wanted to write about that incident. But to be honest, the hand did not rise or simply flew out of my head. But today is the anniversary of that tragedy for me personally, as these events can never erase from my memory. It was the year 2010. Outside the window, the glorious month of November was raging with its winds. It was snowing heavily and then torrential rain. Boredom in a word. But nowadays, such a time of year as autumn brings such associations. And then, being 24 years old, we were attracted to all the new and unexplored. I studied and lived to this day in Moscow. I have ordinary parents. They now also hold a network of stores with leather goods, ranging from handbags and ending with sheepskin. After graduation, I was given a certain amount of money as a graduation gift. But this is more of a convention. My parents knew that I would not work as an economist. But where would I go? For me to sit still for more than 10 minutes is something out of the realm of fantasy. So all the money I was given went to open my own little store. In fact, I omit to this day. Business is booming, even in spite of this new contagion, which has shaken our planet for almost six months. I think everybody knows what I mean. Well, just before the opening, in order to dive into work with a clear head, I decided to take a little trip with some friends. I do not know what it is like for someone, but I personally do not like to fly to other countries and wander around all sorts of museums and stuff. Yes, it's educational and certainly very interesting. But for me, it's better to get in the car and break away to the mountains or forest, where no man has ever set foot. So we decided to go to Arkhangelsk. Perhaps you are surprised now. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. But just imagine autumn, silence, tent, mountains, river bonfire in the evening. Yes, fresh, just caught fish on the grill. Isn't it pure pleasure? That's why we went to Arkhangelsk region, packed all necessary things and loaded them into the old land cruiser. Then we set off on our way. There was a positive, friendly atmosphere in the cabin. Igor, Volodya, my two friends from university. Great guys. Igor graduated with honors and works at a large firm. Volodya, just like me, continues his family business. He is already married, which was a stumbling block to our trip. But as you can see, it all worked out, and this situation was greatly mocked on the way to our destination. I was driving. Igor, the car didn't know how to drive. He didn't even drive an automatic transmission. Why not? Yeah, I asked him a couple of times, he went off topic. Maybe he had some reason. Fofka knew how to drive, but since he had a liter of dark beer in his system, he couldn't drive anymore. So we had to look for a place to sleep. In principle, it's possible to take a nap in the car. But please, the farther away from Moscow, the lower the prices. So we searched for a roadside hotel. We drove five kilometers and then another five. I was beginning to feel sleepy. Suddenly, Igor points to the sign of the road. Look, look, there's a sign. And he was right. In the headlight sign appeared with an arrow somewhere to the left and the inscription hotel. I slowed to 60 and turned on the high beams. Almost following the headlight sign out of the darkness was a fork and a secondary road sign. The road began to go into the thick forest, and I asked Igor to open the map in the navigator 
and see where this road leads. He did so immediately. And we saw that a couple of kilometers further on there was a small village and beyond it a road. In the same way, in two or three kilometers, it comes out on the M8 highway again. After about 10 minutes of driving, we got to the first cabins. What is strange, there were no signs of the name of the settlement. But taking into account that we were hundreds of kilometers away from Moscow in general, there was nothing to be surprised about. Then we entered the town, or rather a small town, and we found the hotel and parked the car. We went inside. There we were met by a girl of about 25. The cop was already showing 11 o'clock, and I was exhausted. Went to bed. Later, after leaving the room, I went to the next door and knocked on it. It was Igor's room, but there was no answer. After half a minute, there was still no answer. I decided to open it. It gave way, and the room was in total darkness. Igor, are you there? I stepped into the room, and I dropped the word. Fumbling for a switch, I pressed it, and the light flooded my friend's room. Together with him and his body, lying on the bed, with his throat slit, and with all his strength, screamed in the hallway. A sound was heard. I turned around and grabbed the vase on the nightstand. He showed up at the door. Volodya, why are you yelling? I stood there and looked at my friend with huge, wide-open eyes, and he walked into the room, saw me, and then he looked at the bed and backwards. Shit, Igor, how could it be? Who did this? Are you kidding me? I just came in. Then let's go downstairs and call the police. At this point, we decided. We went downstairs, and I rang the bell at reception. We stood in silence for about a minute, and I pushed the bell a few more times. Is anyone there? Then we heard a rustling sound upstairs. We ran as fast as we could to the second floor, and when we got up, we saw things flying out of our rooms on their own. We looked at each other. We stood there like we'd never seen anything before. Hey, where are the car keys? In my jeans in my room, I squeezed out. And at the same second, my pair of jeans flew out of the room. I quickly rushed in that direction the corridor with each step, as it seemed to me was getting longer and longer. But after a couple of seconds, I reached my clothes and grabbing my jeans by the belt, I glanced toward my room. From there, two red flashlights stared at me from the darkness. I couldn't claim they were eyes, for if they were any kind of evil thing, they would probably make some kind of movement. But here it wasn't. We looked at each other for about 10 seconds and it didn't move. Come here. Well, well, what are you standing up for? Come here. This shout pulled me out of my stupor and I turned towards Vova, who was calling me, and I headed in his direction. He immediately jumped out of his seat and ran downstairs, and I followed him. The main door was locked, so I took the car keys out of my jeans pocket and ran behind the counter where the girl who was sitting with us the night before was sitting and grabbed the key. But just then, I looked up at Vova and squeezed the keys so hard that they made a characteristic plastic crunch and I froze for a few moments as I hung in the air as if someone was holding it in his hand. At a height of two meters, blood started pouring out of his mouth. I don't know how much longer I would have stood like that if whatever was holding him at that height hadn't let go of his body, and he fell to the floor as a stone, making a distinctive crunching sound. At the same second, I jumped to the door and put the key in the lock, then jumped out into the street and pressed the alarm button. The car opened, I got behind the wheel, started the engine, and raced back to Moscow. I don't know how long I drove, but I remember that I called the police right away, and we drove a couple of hours to the place. As we approached, the road continued to turn left off the M8 highway. Here were the familiar cabins again. Only in the daylight, it looked kind of abandoned. At the end of the street, where the hotel was, there was a burnt-out building. 